Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. The Kurdish region in Iraq has been inundated with heavy rainfall. This, as the flood water has now swept through the city of Arab, a catastrophic event that has destroyed Iraq, often known as Mesopotamia. What dreadful thing has just happened? How strong is the storm? Why invade Iraq? Is that a sign from heaven? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. Let's get started. Iraq, officially the Republic of Iraq, is a country in West Asia and in the geopolitical region known as the Middle East. The country is known because of many conflicts due to the history of struggle for independence and freedom. Iraq is small but very resilient and strong. This country is very famous for oil. Iraq is often compared to Saudi Arabia because of its abundant and abundant oil. The beautiful city of Ale. The driest month is August, with just one day of rain. On the contrary, the month when it rained the most is March, with eight days of rain. This is normal for Ale. When heavy rains appear, that's right in Ale, there is heavy rain. The dense dark clouds began to emerge in the sky, creating a gloomy and heavy atmosphere. The wind began to blow from the north, carrying the first raindrops. The first drops of rain fell gently like bright spots flying in the space. The sound of the rain became strong like the tone of a vibrant shower. The streets and alleys became flooded with floodwaters flowing through small roads and grooves. The rain lasted for a long time, wetting the walls and roofs. The people who go out must be shielded with raincoats or sunshine to protect them from the dense rain. Suddenly, thunder rang from afar, like the sounds of wings of fierce beasts. The wind began to blow strongly, sweeping the tornadoes and heavy rains from the sky, as if to erase all traces of normal life. Look at this over OTA. Is this a wrath of God? If you understand wrathful as vengeful, then it might be hard to reconcile these two attributes of God. But if the wrath of God is simply his righteous judgment against sinful humanity, then there is really no conflict between the two. All of humanity is deserving of punishment, and a righteous God would correctly give us what we have earned. But God is also love, and he has provided a way of redemption faith in the atoning blood of his Son. The Wrath of God There are some circles within Christianity that seem to emphasize the wrath of God, and on the other extreme are those who are unable to fit it into their picture of God. Between those two extremes are those who are not quite sure what to make of a God of wrath. But what does the Bible itself have to say about this topic? The Wrath of God There are some circles within Christianity that seem to emphasize the wrath of God, and on the other extreme are those who are unable to fit it into their picture of God. Between those two extremes are those who are not quite sure what to make of a God of wrath. But what does the Bible itself have to say about this topic? What is wrath? There are a number of words in both the Old and New Testaments that are translated as wrath. These words are also frequently translated as anger. Most generally, they refer to God's response to human disobedience, but the words are also used in relation to a negative human response to other people. There is really no good way to soften the wrath of God to mean anything other than an angry response on God's part to human disobedience. Where do we see the wrath of God in the Bible? The wrath of God is a common expression in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 9 verse 8 is an example of this usage. At Horeb you aroused the Lord's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you. This combination of God's wrath, human disobedience, and punishment is a common theme in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets. The primary message of the prophets was one of judgment against disobedient people, typically with a call for repentance. There are also dozens of references Even though Jesus and his disciples proclaimed the kingdom of God and expressed God's love for humanity, they did not dismiss the wrath of God. The wrath that would come to all who were disobedient to the gospel message. 
Jesus promised to come again, and Old Testament and New Testament prophecies point to the second coming of Christ as a pivotal event in God's plan. Second coming, why must Jesus Christ come back to the earth? It sounds like a question that belongs to church folk only and one that doesn't really have any impact on the lives of the non-religious. Yet, in fact, the answer to this question is critical for the entire human race, believers and non-believers, Christian and non-Christian. Why do we need Christ's second coming? Simply stated, for human survival. As we will see, Jesus Christ has promised to come to prevent humanity from annihilation. Let's stop for a minute and look soberly at the many threats to the survival of humanity. First, let's examine the subject of modern warfare and the armaments at the disposal of mankind. False Christs in the end time, right after discussing the beginning of the Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21, Jesus transitioned to his return to earth. He began with a warning, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Verses 23 to 24. Jesus had already warned about general religious deception, but this follow-up warning had a different focus. He warned that in the end times, there would be a surge in both false Christs and false prophets. False prophets are religious leaders who generally preach false doctrines. False Christs are people who claim to be a messianic figure sent from God or, in some cases, who claim to be Jesus himself. Some may read that and dismiss people who make these claims as crazy fanatics who only appeal to a handful of gullible people. But Jesus wasn't just warning about fringe extremists with tiny followings. He described these people as also showing great signs and wonders to deceive. Signs and wonders, someone with long hair and a robe coming along and claiming to be Jesus is one thing, such people are easy to dismiss. But Jesus said these future false Christs will be much more dangerous because some of them will actually perform miracles. Not parlor tricks, but actual delusions manufactured by Satan himself. Scripture shows that the demonic realm does have the ability to manipulate the laws of nature to make it appear certain people have miraculous powers. In the book of Exodus, there is an interesting encounter between Aaron and Pharaoh's magicians. After God miraculously transformed Aaron's rod into a serpent, Pharaoh's magicians were able to mimic the miracle in like manner with their enchantments, Exodus 7 verses 11 to 12. In the New Testament, we read about a false teacher named Simon who built a following for himself due in part to his ability to perform miracles, Acts 8 verses 9 to 11. Simon convinced many people that his miracles came from God, verse 10, but these miracles were not from God. They were done through the power of Satan. In the end time, these miracles will be so impressively deceptive that even the elect, God's people, could be taken in by them. Signs and wonders appeal to the emotions. Miracles can seem to validate a message. But God warns us to reject any messages that conflict with God's law and biblical truth, Isaiah 8 verse 20 and 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 to 10. When we allow our emotions to be stirred to the point that we prioritize emotion over truth, we are in grave danger and easy prey for deception. This is what will happen in the end time, people will be taken in by titillating signs and wonders and end up inadvertently following false teachers and the dark forces behind them. Don't be one of those people. After Jesus warned about miracle-working false Christs, he continued, See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Jesus was talking about individuals who not only claim his authority but claim his very identity. The few who make these kinds of claims today don't have significant followings. But as the end time gets closer, there will be more and more of them. They will be more persuasive and attract larger followings. But as the end time gets closer, there will be more and more of them. They will be more persuasive and attract larger followings. To repeat Jesus' words, do not believe it, 
what will Jesus's second coming be like? So, how will you be able to know the difference between a false Christ and the real Christ? Jesus provided the litmus test in the next verse, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The genuine second coming of Jesus Christ will be unmistakable and absolutely impossible to miss or counterfeit. Jesus compared his return to lightning flashing across the sky. Just as natural lightning appears above us in the sky, is immensely powerful, and can't be faked, Jesus's return will be from the sky. It will be a colossal display of supernatural power and will be a sight and sound beyond anything any human force could produce. A few verses down, Jesus elaborated further, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Power and great glory, that is how Jesus will return. There will be nothing secret about it. But when Jesus says, they will see the Son of Man, to whom does, they, refer? Every eye will see him. That question is answered in Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who peer. That doesn't mean everyone will immediately grasp who he is. He won't look anything like the popular image of Jesus. But every person on earth will hear an ear-piercing trumpet blast and see an immensely powerful spirit being, Jesus Christ, emanating energy, glowing white, with eyes like burning fire, riding a gallant white horse and carrying a sword to make war. Revelation 11 verses 14 to 15, 19:11-12. Don't be confused by any human impostors or anyone claiming Jesus's second coming will be anything other than the earth-shaking spectacle described in your Bible. When Jesus returns, you will know it. You won't have an iota of doubt. What will be the sign of your coming? Jesus' disciples were keenly interested in the future, as many continue to be today. Near the end of Jesus' life, his disciples approached him privately on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the magnificent temple in Jerusalem, and asked him about what was to come. Earlier that day, while they had looked with awe at the huge stones and beautiful workmanship of the temple, Jesus had shocked them with this prophecy, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another, that shall not be thrown down. So when they got him alone, they followed up. They asked Jesus, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? There, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus Christ answered their questions with one of the pivotal prophecies of the Bible. Because of the location, this message, recorded in Matthew 24-2, Mark 13, and Luke 21, has come to be known as the Olivet Prophecy or Olivet Discourse. Jesus said that after the tribulation would come signs in the heavens, and then he would return to the earth with the great sound of a trumpet. In the same way he left the earth in the clouds, he will return to the earth through the clouds. Though many 21st century Christians have been taught that Jesus Christ will come secretly before the time of tribulation to take the saints to heaven, this theory is not supported by the scriptures. Many Christians believe that when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he will approach secretly to snatch away all believers and all children in a rapture. The theory is that they will be taken to heaven, where they will be protected during the great tribulation. The Rapture Theory this teaching is often referred to as the rapture theory. It is a theory because it has no definitive proof. Neither Jesus nor the apostles taught that such an event will occur, and in fact, it has no scriptural support. Although there is some disagreement as to its exact origin, the doctrine was unheard of until the early 19th century and became widespread when it was incorporated into the footnotes of the Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield's comments are in reference to 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The phrase, shall be caught up, is believed by adherents of the rapture theory to describe the rapture. One meaning of the English word, rapture, is being carried away in body or in spirit. 
However, the word rapture is not used here or any other place in scripture. The phrase shall be caught up is translated from a Greek word that means to catch, pull, or take by force. This is a strong word in the Greek, emphasizing that the action will be sudden and forceful. It conveys the forceful power of God by which he will resurrect those who had died. In the Vulgate Bible, the phrase, shall be caught up, is translated, repeamer, from which the word, rapture, is derived. In order to see this statement in its context, it's helpful to read 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 17. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The promise of a resurrection, not a rapture. Apparently, these first-century Christians had expected Jesus to return during their lifetime. When some died before he came back to the earth, they were concerned and confused. To encourage them, Paul appeals to their faith in Jesus' resurrection and the promise of a resurrection of the faithful when he returns. Note that this passage does not include any warning about or even a reference to the Great Tribulation at the end of the age. Paul wasn't warning them to be mindful of their Christian responsibilities so they could be among those who were caught up together to meet the Lord in the air to escape difficult times. In fact, if the faithful are dead and in their graves, why would they even need to be snatched away to escape the tribulation? By reading the full context, we see that Paul reminded them of the promise of the resurrection of the faithful when Jesus returns. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.